Uh, Dr. Bostad is a meteorologist instructor at uh, the Weather Services Morning Decision Training Division. Uh, her career path also included 13 years in two forecast offices, three years as an outreach and partnership liaison for the climate program at NWS headquarters, and a couple of years wearing an extra hat as a regional climate program manager. A Michigan native, Dr. Bausted earned her undergraduate degrees in meteorology, geography, and English from Central Michigan, and then a master's in meteorology from Penn State. She diverted mid-career to earn her PhD in applied climatology from the University of Nebraska, and she did that through NWS's university assignment program while working at a forecast office. Um, for those of you who work at a forecast office, you know how extremely rare that is. Um, she does uh, side research projects on the weather and climate events of the Laura Ingalls Wilder books, The Health of Meteorologists While Working uh, High Impact Weather Events, The Composite Environments and Climatologies of Severe Thunderstorms and Tornadoes, and a few other projects that have crept in along the way. Dr. Bausted serves on the AMS Committee on Environmental Stewardship and is a past member of the AMS Committee on Applied Climatology. She is currently president of the Laura Ingalls Wilder Legacy and Research Association. Um, I also attended her uh, talk on storytelling at uh, NWA this past year, which was also very well received. So we're very happy to have you here. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, Ryan. So again, my name is Barb Mays Bowstead, and um, I'm going to walk with you, uh, except not really walk with you, a bit down my career path. And that's not to make it about me and looky all the things I've gotten to do through the years, but to help demonstrate that whatever path you're on, even if it's not the one you think that's a normal one or a traditional one, is probably the right one for you. Um, if you're not a runner, you may not know what a wind sprint is. A wind sprint is that, that start and stop type of running where you sprint for a while as fast as you can and then slow down to a walk or a super slow jog. And I use that as the analogy here because like Ryan said, it's very rare that a career path is a smooth linear progression up to the next thing and up to the next thing. Uh, we get diverted, we stop and pause, we make a jump we didn't expect to make, and uh, our path just winds right along with us. So uh, let's take a little trip down a, a wind sprint career path and see where we go. And uh, Ryan mentioned my, my college background. Um, when I came to the, uh, well, really when I entered my master's program at Penn State, uh, I was already a little bit burned out. I had been a serious academic my whole college career, and it just hit me and my mental health was suffering and my physical health was suffering. Um, and when I thought I had come there to go on through a PhD, I knew as soon as I got there that I had to get my master's degree and get out. So um, one long evening I was working on writing my, my thesis in my office and I needed some inspiration. So I started looking around at jobs, uh, just job listings, found this really cool job that talked about working in the climate community, linking climate and weather, working in partnerships, having a mentor, just all these phrases that sounded so appealing. I really had no concept of what I was applying for, what the job was or where it was. Uh, it, I had a vague sense it was for the government because I was applying through the government system at the time. I, uh, I applied on that job and I had an excellent advisor, Dr. Jenny Evans, who's now the president of AMS and Jenny, sat me down a couple weeks later and asked if I was serious when I applied for this job. And I said, well, let's say that I am. I was invited for an interview. I went down and was offered the job. And it was really only later that I figured out that this was for the National Weather Service. I, uh, I wasn't someone who came up into my career thinking that I wanted to work for the Weather Service. And uh, in fact, there's a bit of a story about that. Um, at an AMS meeting when I was an undergraduate student. Uh, as many of us do, I went down to the hotel lobby to have a beverage and uh, try to network a little bit. I was down there with a couple of friends of mine and uh, they were both males, we were all undergraduates. Those two were very interested in working for the Weather Service and I wasn't so much. But we ran into the, at the time, director of the Weather Service's Western region, Vicki Nadolsky, um, who, 
as a woman in meteorology was really trying to work on me to get interested in becoming a forecaster in the weather service. And I looked at her in the eyes and I told her, I am not going to work for the weather service and I am certainly not going to be an operational forecaster. Um, so there I was working for the National Weather Service. And uh, yes, she did find out later and remind me of the story, but uh, it, the job was every bit as cool as I thought it was going to be. I had a designated mentor, uh, Mr. Bob Leffler, who is in the middle picture, the tall guy in the middle with a white mustache. And for the first year that I worked there, he and I were designated to work together on all of these projects related to outreach, customer service, uh, on the climate program and the weather service. And he did his best to teach me everything he knew. I also had a great boss at the time, Bob Livesey, who taught me more lessons along the way. Things like make sure you maximize your TSP as quickly as you can because you're going to need that retirement income. Um, things like don't you dare give leave back to the government. If you have a leave balance, use it up and have that life outside the office. And he, he practiced what he preached as well. He was a, a great mentor and a great coach and um, I think struck a great balance of taking this person who is fresh out of college in a sea of people who had been in their careers for 20 or 30 years and giving me guidance, but also empowering me to, to uh, do some work. So uh, what I learned along the way there, the very first thing I probably learned was uh, to stay open to opportunities. I, had, I didn't know what to expect going into this job, except that nobody had had this job before me. So I had some opportunity to help shape it. I also um, didn't know a lot about what it was like to work for the weather service. I didn't know where I wanted my career to go. I wasn't even certain I wanted to stay in the weather service at the time. But I, what I learned in that, it was a, a really important thing to stay open to what opportunities may be out there or stay open to tasks that may be more or less directly related to what I think my job is. Um, I also found pretty early on that those mentors were incredibly important, and it was especially important at an early career stage, but I think it remains that way throughout the rest of my career that wherever I go and whatever challenge I'm taking, it's really important for me to find someone who can mentor me a little bit along the way. The third thing I had to learn in my early career was maybe the hardest one of all, and that is to be patient. Um, and I saw a lot of my, there were, there were not that many peers at Weather Service Headquarters, people who were new and young and fresh out of college taking jobs there. But for those of us who were, we felt isolated enough to actually make a, a club about it, an organization where we'd go and meet a couple times a month to air our grievances. And it was hard to be patient. We're fresh out of college. We're young. We're energetic. We want to do stuff. We want to do all this stuff. And yet we have things to learn and training to take. And, and we need to, uh, I guess in the words of Aaron Burr and Hamilton, wait for it a little bit. Um, let things settle. Let things come to us. Um, so I took a lot of time to, to learn that lesson of being patient and, and letting those opportunities unfold in front of me. And I mentioned this already, I'm a trainer, it's in my title, so I'm going to use this a lot, but it's always been an important part of a career, and that is to learn as much as possible as quickly as you can, right? When you graduate and leave school and come into the weather service, you basically come into the weather service and get another degree in how to be a meteorologist in the weather service. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of training out there, but there's a lot of informal, this isn't anywhere in a module, but also needs to be learned type of training. Um, Right away in my career, making that first step at headquarters is not what you would call a traditional path. It's not something very many people come into the weather service to do. Um, and I think one of the things I learned there was the value that it would have for me to learn more about what goes on in the field offices, which would mean that I would have to do the thing I would said I would never do, and that is go and work as an operational forecaster. Um, I'm not saying that this is the case for everybody, but for me, I felt like I could be a better resource or more helpful if I had firsthand experience of being a forecaster and what it's like in a field office um, instead of sitting at headquarters and talking about it. So to me, that, that became a valuable thing. Um, so what did I have to do? I had to take, uh, well, at the time, what was called DLOC radar training. Um, while I worked at headquarters and 
I did that in conjunction with uh, some folks who helped me out at the WFO and State College. Um, again, a non-traditional path. I had to get permission from my boss to take training that had nothing to do with my uh, designated job, my performance plan. Um, and I did that. I got the training and started applying on a job or two. And uh, because my job uh, had required me being out there so much at meetings, at conferences, being that liaison that was in my job title, I um, had the opportunity to meet a lot of people around the Weather Service along the way. And one of the wonderful people I met along the way was Ray Wolf, who uh, helped me find my way to the WFO in Quad Cities. So this begins more of the path of the Weather Service Forecast Offices. I spent a few years in the Quad Cities and then a decade or so at WFO Omaha Valley. I had missed the science of doing our jobs. I had really missed digging into weather data and climate data um, and, and actually doing that stuff that we learn about a bit in school and actually getting to work radar like I had learned in DLOC class. Um, so getting back into science was invigorating for me. Um, and along the way at these second stops, I'm kind of combining the two stops in the Quad Cities and in Omaha, um, started to learn some lessons there too. I had this headquarters experience. I still had um, a few side projects that my managers would let me dabble with from time to time. Um, so I'm already coming in not as your average or normal type of career path. I didn't have time in as an intern. So I hadn't gone through a lot of that spin up training that had happened for most people who come in as a forecaster. I had to take that as I went. Um, and yet I had been in my career long enough to have a lot of familiarity with the weather service and uh, its workings, which uh, helped me be useful on some regional type teams. One of the first things I learned is how important it is to do your regular job first. Um, we all have interests probably that are outside of just the duties we are assigned to do. Um, we may enjoy being a forecaster first, or we may be acting as a forecaster first because this is where we are and this is what we have to do. Um, but whatever it is, it is so important to do that job first, do the thing you were hired to do first and do it well. Um, that might come easily to you to do that job and do it well, or it might require a lot of work to get good at it. Maybe you find out you're not such a natural forecaster and uh, you really have to take some, you know, big moves to make yourself better at it. I found out along the way that I was terrible at forecasting hydrology. So um, I worked with our hydrologist in the Quad Cities to assign myself everything uh, hydro related for training, for example. And then you can start to stretch yourself. You can start to look for where there are other things you can start to work on or where you can contribute your skills. Um, for me, of all the things I had done at headquarters uh, in the climate services division, uh, the thing that meant the most to me that I really wanted to keep involved with if I could was being involved with the operational climate services training that we had started near the end of my term there. And learning how to become a an instructor, a trainer, was a stretch for me. Um, as I was figuring out where I wanted to stretch that, I started to take some training. Um, that's actually multiple functions. And I told you this is going to be a theme in this, in this conversation. But taking training is so important. I took the stuff that I have to take, of course. But um, I also looked for the stuff I felt weak at and took some training in it. And I looked for the stuff that I was really interested in and took all the training in it. Um, I. I uh, sought out conference opportunities because those are training opportunities too. And all of these things fed back into both doing my job and some of those stretch goals that I had, some of the other things I really wanted to work on through my career. I wanted to join teams and projects and that starts locally. Um, your teammates are gonna appreciate it if you're helping out at home first, right? They, uh, the projects that you have to accomplish there and then uh, looking to other bigger scope projects you may have an interest in, those regional or national teams. I learned, for example, that if you uh, want to join a regional team as a bargaining unit member in the Weather Service, you have to join the union. Um, and that seems like a weird hurdle, but one that I was 
willing to do so that I could be a part of those regional and national decisions too. The last bit of advice I got, uh, and this again comes from my mentor, Ray, uh, in the Quad Cities, was to get really good at something. Um, you know, learn as much as you can about the things that are important, but he said, try to take the time to really get specialized in something and get the really in-depth knowledge of that thing. And, you know, something even more narrow than get good at severe weather or get good at climate. What thing, what, what narrow niche of that climate world or that severe weather world could you really take a deep dive and get to know and do some local studies and have some research and teach the rest of your peers about it? And I thought that was great advice. That probably helped lead me to um, going on for my PhD. So, and on that note, um, I moved from the Quad Cities to Omaha and that was a lateral move for me. And I made that move for some reasons that were a mix of personal and professional. Uh, on, on a very personal note, I was getting married and wanted to live closer to the person I was marrying. Um, I also wanted to work in an office where I could lead the climate program. And I had learned so much from Ray, uh, who led it in Quad Cities, that I wanted to start to apply what I had learned from him. Um, and the third thing that really motivated that move was the presence of the University of Nebraska. A few years had gone by now, and I was starting to think that maybe, just maybe, I could go back to doing more studies again. Um, I had gotten over some of the hard hits that my physical and mental health had taken during the master's program, and I was ready to tackle that challenge again. So um, Ryan brought this up, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it, too, and that is that side challenge I took to myself of getting my PhD. Um, I did use the university assignment program in, in the weather service that is still on the books and the directives. It is unfunded, meaning if you want to pay for your graduate school, you have to find another source, whether that's you or the department. But the program is there and it asks you to go through regional approval and it will help you make up some of the time it takes to take courses in something that is directly related to the Weather Service's mission, meteorology, climatology. Uh, I suppose there may be some arguments for some leadership or business type of degrees, but I'm not certain. Um, it only covers the coursework. Uh, the university program, university assignment program doesn't help you find time to write your thesis or dissertation. That part's on your own. But it was just enough of the boost that I needed to figure out how I could possibly manage attending a class that was Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 a.m. Um, and the answer to that was I was on a uh, time split program. It was roughly two thirds of my time at the Weather Service, one third assigned to taking coursework. And I crammed as much of the coursework as I could into the first few semesters so that I didn't have to have it linger for long. Um, so I went back. I again had worked through networks that I had been with before and that included Martha Shulsky who is in the graduation picture with me on the lower right and my other co-advisor Dr. Ken Hubbard. Um, the two of them were both people I had met through the years at the Weather Service headquarters as folks who were involved in the climate program and they helped me obtain departmental funding so that I didn't have to pay for it out of my own pocket. Um, and because I wasn't tied to any particular grants, I really had a lot of freedom to uh, pursue whatever, whatever I wanted pending their approval and some you know, in-depth analysis of something related to applied climatology. So uh, we shaped a project that um, allowed me to do a deep dive into some of the weather and climate in Laura Ingalls Wilder's book, The Long Winter. And through that, uh, we created the Accumulated Winter Season Severity Index, or Aussie, um, which is up and running still on the Midwestern Regional Climate Center's website and, and gets its fair share of citations in the media around this time of year, especially. Um, in order for me to go back and do that PhD, it required a lot of layers of support. Um, and all of these had to come together. The university assignment program, um, really was necessary for me. There was no way for me to work in the classes of that particular degree program uh, without moving some shifts or being excused from some shifts. I had to, of course, work through my supervisor and have his approval. And um, 
and he did. He was a willing supporter and helped me navigate the university assignment program, helped me navigate scheduling to make it work. Um, I needed that support from the department because I don't think I could have paid for it without their financial help. And I appreciated their uh, support of finding a degree program and study area that worked and got me to some goals. And then uh, I needed that support at home too. And uh, that's definitely a piece you can't neglect if you're thinking about a big undertaking like this, that you know, all of these factors have to come on board. And that includes someone at home saying, oh, you're going to work basically twice as many hours for the next four years. OK, that's cool. I'll, I'll pick up the housework and do some dinners and, and uh, make sure you have the time you need to do it. That's no small undertaking for them either. Um, but all of these came together. And uh, through that program, not only, of course, did I come out with a dissertation and some papers, but also I had the opportunity to take courses in some very relevant topics, not just applied climatology and climate dynamics, but um, some leadership courses. They had some excellent courses in understanding um, public leadership and what it's like to have uh, public sector um, uh, mentality, what that is and why people choose public sector over private sector, some very interesting things. Um, that program took me four years and that's actually a standard for someone who is not working full time. So I felt very proud of getting that degree done in the four years. And it turned out that I had to get that program done in four years. Uh, because if you look real closely at that uh, graduation gown, there's a little bump under there. And along comes my motivation to get the degree finished. Um, so here's where I start to transition into talking a bit about the family life side of working shifts in particular. Um, shift work is hard no matter who's doing it. It is taxing on your health. It is taxing on your social life. It's taxing on your family. Um, and when you introduce a baby into the mix, it just makes it so much harder, right? Um, because everything from feeding schedules to daycare schedules can be really thrown off. Um, that's especially true in a dual shift working uh, marriage or partnership, but it's still true even if one person is working those shifts. Everything is so much harder and magnified by the odd hours that you're keeping and, and how tired you are a lot of times. Um, so we get a little sweet here of pictures of, of my little guy through the years um, visiting me at the office or on some overlap at the office um, as we were trying to make it work. Um, I think one of the hardest things I learned about, uh, because this is very much outside my expertise, is all of the laws and rights and rules that apply to parental leave and lactation rights and so many things that you didn't really think about when you weren't a parent, or at least I didn't when I wasn't a parent. Um, we have a, a fun picture of uh, one of my lactation sessions on the lower left. Um, sometimes I really had to take that time and focus on a baby, but other times either I needed to focus on the weather or I didn't have time to do anything else. And um, yes, that's a hand analysis there, uh, just about the right amount of time to get that done. Uh, when I paired those activities. Working women who have children have an extra burden on them of managing things like the feeding of the baby, um, especially if they are a breastfeeding parent, and um, a societal expectation that doesn't necessarily fall to men either. Um, so that burden became an exceptional challenge. And what I learned is when they tell you to find a family balance or a work and family balance. I don't think there's such thing as a balance there. There's never a time when everything is perfectly aligned and you're standing on one foot and, and never afraid you're gonna fall off the pedestal there. Uh, what you find day to day are the trade-offs. And that means in some days that child comes first. You know, the child is sick, the child needs help with something. The parent is sick, the other parent is sick and needs your help. And sometimes that has to dominate. And other times the trade-off comes to your work side where you've got a major event and you've got to be there for that overtime. And that might mean that you had to get a babysitter that day after your daycare and you haven't seen your child since yesterday. Um, but that was one of those times where work became so much more critical. For some people, um, 
they make that work, right? You, a lot of people out there have made this balance between shift work and family work, and they're okay with it. For some people, it is too much for their family situation. It's too much for their mental health stability and or it's too much for their physical health stability. And the impetus to leave shift work and find something else to do becomes great. I would consider myself somebody who fell into that second category. Um, I had been very content working in the office, in the forecast office. I had um, maybe gotten a little tired of the routine of forecasting something every day, especially the days that weren't so interesting or challenging. But I had found things to do along the way. I had taken that regional set of duties for the climate program and helped the region get through a gap in their staffing. I had done some research projects. Um, I had taken on some outreach and decision support. And that was, it all felt great. It was all really interesting. And at the same time, I had been doing it for 13 years. And I was ready for that next challenge. And these factors that come together come again in sprints and starts after being you know, slowed to a walk and sometimes a crawl there in the same job for about a decade. Um, the next stop came as something of a sprint and I find myself here at the warning decision training division. Um, and I find myself in a position where I'm not working shifts. Uh, the routine isn't quite the same kind of routine. Um, where you, you know, on a weather service office routine, you walk in and you make that forecast every day and what you're forecasting may change, but the process of it pretty much doesn't, uh, just gets modified through the years. Um, and I'm glad I got to break out of that. I was ready. I was ready to do something very different from what I had been doing. Um, and I found myself here in, in a very happy stop where I get that chance to uh, continue to teach something I had been uh, interested in doing throughout my career and had had the opportunity con to continue throughout my career. Um, what's also interesting for me here at this site is how my role has changed. Um, as many of you know, there's not a lot of turnover in some forecast offices. And when you come in as a newer person, you're sort of always the newer person and maybe the younger person too. So here at WDTD, I made an abrupt transition. You, know, you want to talk about a sprint, at least in my mind, it really felt like a sprint from being a young and new one, even though I had been in another place for 10 years, I still had felt new, to being the elder female of the group. <laughs> um, and, uh, and getting invited to do talks like this kind of reminds me that I still think I fit that category where um, here I thought all along I was early career. and. Uh, AMS put out that opportunity for the early career leadership development program and I sat down to apply on it and looked at the at the requirements and to my shock and horror I was not eligible anymore um, and then I find myself here in a group of oh roughly 25 people give or take and most people who work with me here are younger than me and uh, we especially have a cadre of younger female employees here. So I found myself all of a sudden thrust into what I would call a mid-career role when I quite didn't notice that I had been getting old. So the first thing I had to do here is back to square one of um, what I discovered in the WFOs, and that is you've got to learn your new job and learn how to do it well. This is a different job. This isn't forecasting and doing the science. So even though I had done some training through the years, um, that's not the same as mastering the role of becoming an instructor. And getting into a new job like this uh, requires that humility, even in the mid phase of your career to step back and say, um, not only am I not the expert in this, there are probably people here who are uh, much more of experts in it than me. And it happens that they're younger than me. And I need to do everything I can to learn from them and learn from those who are around me to learn how to master this new job. Trainers have to train too. <laughs> um, and then this sharing experiences thing I have here is a twofold sharing of experiences. Um, so first, it means that part of the reason I'm here is because I have experience from forecast offices to share with my colleagues who don't have quite as much experience in that area and to help them put into context the things that they are doing and developing. 
And then there's this whole other meaning to the phrase sharing experiences. And what that means is um, I'm well along in my career, and very happy where I am. Um, I don't necessarily need to do everything that comes my way myself. But there are a lot of younger employees around me who could really use those opportunities to grow and develop. So what that means is when I'm working on something um, in a partnership with one of my colleagues and uh, we're asked to represent it at a conference, for example, it's asking and encouraging the people I'm working with to go and represent that work instead of doing it myself. And that's the second way I mean a shared experience, that it's time to be there to support the folks who are ready to start their careers and need that networking and visibility in a way that I definitely don't. And I'm also finding in this role here, as I'm the elder lady of the group, that I am um, more asked to step in in a mentoring and coaching role. I'm I maybe not asked even, but I feel an obligation to be there because I have that time in and uh, other folks are looking for that kind of experience to help shape their careers. And I guess that's a little bit of what I'm doing here today, too, that, you know, I'm here and have had some experiences and learned some lessons, and maybe somebody can learn from that. Or at the very least, I can be here to demonstrate that whatever path folks are taking um, is the right one for them. Um, very often when someone is sitting with two opportunities in front of them and trying to figure out which way to go, they're both good opportunities. And that's why the decision is so hard. It's a matter of making the decision and then um, jumping into it wholeheartedly and, and seeing what develops. So what comes next for me in the future? Um, that's a great question. And um, I've had a manager or two or a mentor or two along the way who have asked me what I want to be when I grow up. You know, I've dabbled in climate. I've dabbled in very near-term weather, um, and I've crossed the bridge between the two. I've done training, I've done program management. So what am I aiming at? <laughs> um, and that's a great question. And maybe someday I'll figure that out. But I think what I've learned the most is it doesn't really matter so much what I wanna be in 10 years. For me, um, it's important to learn everything and be everything I can at where I am now and maybe think a little bit ahead to where I might want to be in a few years, or um, if certain opportunities came my way, is that something I would want to consider? Um, being present here is a very important thing for me, um, and having goals is still important, even if I don't know for sure if I'm in this job for the rest of my career or, you know, may decide to make a move in a year. I think the uh, episode with uh, Vicki Nadolsky from Western Region long ago taught me to never say never because that's the thing you'll end up doing. So um, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Even if I had unlimited time and no imposition of bureaucratic structure on whatever I could do, I still don't know if I could define it because I like to do so many of every little thing. Uh, I like to do the research and I like to do the teaching and I like to do some science and I like to do some bureaucracy. And yes, I said that out loud. Um, so it's okay for me that I don't know exactly where I wanna go in the future. Um, I'm very comfortable and I'm comfortable keeping my options open and, and seeing what comes next. So um, I'm not certain what will come next for me except uh, where my priorities are with taking care of my family and um, making sure that I am active and happy in the job that I'm doing and still learning and growing and stretching right here where I am. Um, that is all the time that I took for uh, my career path and my prepared comments, I guess. I am uh, available on email to anybody who might uh, either after this want to contact me or somebody who may be watching remotely and has questions and wants to contact me, barbara.mays at noaa.gov. I'm also active on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is at WinBarb if you'd like to reach me there. And finally, for those who are in the weather service, I am all available on the employees of NWS Facebook page, the women's Facebook page, and the diversity Facebook page, and I'm happy to have conversations there too. Uh, I believe we have a fair amount of time if there are questions or topics anyone would like me to talk about. And uh, I want to thank everybody for 
tuning into the call here or listening remotely later. All right, thanks, Barb. Um, if you have questions, um, you can type them in the chat box. I see uh, some familiar names popping in there. Um, let's see. Diana Francisco asks, any tips on how to find and develop a relationship with a mentor? I'm having a difficult time with this. I've reached out to a few people and had meetings with them, but the conversations didn't continue. Oh, that's a great question. Um, there are two types of mentorship, and one of them is uh, designated and formal, and the other one is organic and happens kind of on its own. Uh, if you're looking for a mentor, I could strongly recommend the formal mentoring programs from NOAA and from the Weather Service, and the Weather Service is currently doing a uh, sign up for it now. Um, those are for folks who are in-house in the Weather Service. Um, more broadly, um, you know, sometimes those formal mentorships work and sometimes they don't. I had a couple of those formal mentorships and some of them just didn't take, you know, you don't have the chemistry with the person you've been assigned to and you, uh, you know, it just kind of fizzles out after a couple of meetings and that's the end of that. Um, I think a good way to find a mentor if you are uh, looking for somebody but maybe uh, don't have someone locally who fits the bill is to look for the people who are doing stuff you like or stuff you want to do and um, perhaps that's somebody who's in a job that you strive to attain um, and maybe that's someone who's doing this really cool research project that really caught your attention whatever your particular niche may be um, and reach out to that person and ask them if they have any thoughts for somebody who's coming into what they're doing um, I also think a little bit of mentoring by introduction is helpful. Um, I did the research experience for undergraduate programs at the University of Oklahoma when I was an undergraduate. And through that, you're given a designated mentor who helps you with your research project. Um, and uh, he and I got along just fine, uh, but he's the person who introduced me to uh, Dr. Jenny Evans, who became my uh, advisor in the master's program that networking by introduction really helped pave that relationship. She later introduced me to Bob Livesey, who became my first supervisor. So um, sometimes that next step along the way happens from an introduction or someone who's in a current mentoring phase who can help you reach to the next one. Those are a couple of ideas that I have, and I hope one of them helps you. Uh, if you want to reach out to me directly and um, it, give me a little more of your personal circumstances of what you're interested in. Maybe I know someone who can help you out and I'd certainly welcome you to. Excellent. And Diana said, thank you. Um, Ed McDonough to, says, uh, thank you so much for talking about mentoring. At this stage of my career, I feel one of the most important things I can do is encourage and be there for younger, less experienced people in my field, which is emergency management and public information. So. Nice comment there. I couldn't uh, agree with that more. And you don't have to be 20 years in your, your career to mentor somebody. The first person I mentored, I remember very distinctly, I had been in my career all of a year. And um, we were at an AMS conference and uh, watching a scientific presentation. And I asked a question of the presenter. She found me afterwards and said, I am so glad you asked that question. I thought that was a brilliant and bold question that you asked. I am a student in my last year of my graduate program and can we get in touch? And I, uh, for about a year, was in touch with her to talk about what she might wanna do with her career goals. And um, I, I think I made one introduction to her of somebody at the Climate Prediction Center, which is where she began working out of college and currently still works and is extremely successful in her field. Um, I was one year into my career and still had that ability to reach just a little bit and maybe help someone find a path to get into theirs. So if you're a little bit young, you don't have to wait. All you have to do is look around and look for others who are asking questions too. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, for just another plug for the people who are in the weather service. Um, I just finished the NWS mentoring program, which was very good. 
Um, but it is funny how you talk about the formal and informal mentorships. And it, it's funny, that's a great program because it's not as structured. So you can really take it where you want to go with your mentor once you do establish that relationship. And one of the unique things they did for that was in the beginning, they had this like speed mentoring program where you kind of got onto the software and it hooked you up with various mentors and you got to talk to them for like five minutes. And if you thought the conversation could go longer, you, you could hit the button for an extra five minutes and then you could follow up with those people after. And that was one way they tried to connect people, which was, which was interesting. Um, but again, uh, w once I got in touch with my mentor, it became more of an informal mentorship, even though it was under this, the structure of the program. And, uh, you know, we still have that going forward. So you never know where you're going to find them. Uh, and sometimes it's pretty unexpected. It's true. And, and some mentors are situational. They're your mentor for a year or two when you're doing something. Some mentors end up lasting your whole career um, or through the, from the time they meet you through your career. Um, just as I think it's important that you uh, help out folks who are maybe a step or two behind you. I also think that no matter how old you get in your career, um, it's important to find the mentors around you. Maybe they're younger, maybe they're older, um, but you still need that, that person to help you. Um, I, I like... I like shouting out my mentors, and I think one of them's on this call. Uh, Jamie Betcher, for me, who used to work in WDTG, has been a, a brilliant and helpful mentor in helping me find my path here. Um, and Ray Wolf, who I mentioned earlier, um, wasn't just a situational mentor in Davenport. He's been my mentor throughout my career. Others along the way have been incredibly helpful, and then we move on in our jobs and um, not that we're never in touch again, but you know, we step out of that mentoring role to some ex extent. Very good. Any other questions for Barb uh, before we wrap up? If not, uh, you see her address on the screen. I'm sure she's uh, very willing to talk to anyone who wants to talk offline. And um, Thanks so much again for, for talking for us and a quick shout out to Mike Seaman who set this up with you. I think he was the one who reached out to you. So uh, kudos to him for, for doing that. And, um, and uh, we, uh, I love seeing what everybody's doing and uh, I look forward to following uh, where your journey continues, Barb, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch uh, in the future. Oh, thanks, Ryan. All right, everybody. And uh, this, uh, if you know somebody who wanted to see the talk, maybe couldn't make it, uh, we usually get these up on our YouTube page uh, within a week or so. Uh, so that's, uh, you can just search for AMS Bogum, B-O-G-M in the YouTube or, uh, or Google. And uh, you can find not only Barb's talk, but links to all the other talks that we've done over the past couple of years. So uh, thanks again. Have a great day, everybody. And uh, we'll talk um, soon. Hey, Ryan, I'm so sorry to interrupt a closing, and that was such a smooth one. But one last comment came in, and I wanted to make sure it gets on the record. Okay, yep. Uh, here's, uh, yeah, Becky. Uh, also, never discount the impact simply buying someone a drink can have. Conversation starter, friendly face way to pay it forward. That, um, Becky, thank you. That's a nod to how Becky and I got to know each other better. Um, I, at an AMS conference somewhere along the way, someone who was well advanced in their career bought me a drink and said, let's talk for a minute. And then we moved on. And I've liked that philosophy of, you know what, look around for a younger person. And if they're in the lines for a drink, buy them a drink and have a conversation. So um, I had seen Becky, I think I'd seen her present or uh, maybe had a brief conversation, thought she seemed like a pretty interesting person to talk to. And so we were in line together and I bought her that drink. And um, now I would consider Becky one of my friends in this business. And I'm grateful to have her uh, as a collaborator and friend. Um, so it's amazing how things can start from just a simple conversation and a friendly face. So thanks, Becky, for putting that in there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for joining. And um... We will uh, talk soon. We've got a lot of great talks coming up over the next several months. So keep your eye on our social media pages. If you're not following us already, we are on Facebook and Twitter uh, at AMS Bogum. And uh, so we're going to have a lot of great things, um, including uh, a, 
a joint panel discussion in February um, for uh, with the board AMS board for women and minorities. So look forward to that. And um, with that, have a great day, and uh, we'll talk soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.